All right, so these would be the last problems in uh, 8.5. We finished the other day doing the horizontal asymptotes. So then at around number 14, they started wanting us to graph this. So this will be the ending of rational function. So these two examples I'm gonna do, what they want us to do is find the domain, any asymptotes, So that'd be vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Then they want us to find the X and Y axis, I mean, intercepts. Find the X and Y intercept, and then finally, they want us to graph these. Now you won't have to graph these in math lab. You'll just pick out of, they'll give you four pictures, A, B, C, D, and you just need to pick the one that matches your graph. So, I'll show you what the pictures look like after we work this. So the first thing I'm going to do now for number 14, the graph of the function will be f of x equals 5x plus 2 over x. Now, y'all have calculators. So if you were to graph these on the calculator, Anytime you got more than one part, like my numerator has two different parts, you have to put those in parentheses when you do them on the calculator, okay? Anytime you got more than one term. So if the bottom had more than one term, I'll have to put it in parentheses also. So we'll worry about that when we're graphing it. So the first thing they want me to find is a domain. So to find my domain, I'm gonna set the bottom equal to zero. Well, since that was a single term of an X, there's nothing else to do. So it's telling me that the only number I got to kick out of my domain is zero. And notice there's not any single X's on the top. I've got a factor of a five X plus two, but no single X's. So this vertical asymptote will not cancel out like some of y'all seen the other day. So the domain in interval notation would be from negative infinity till we hit zero union around zero and head towards positive infinity. So that's what you want to put in for your domain. Now I'm going to, so that takes care of the domain. So now I'm going to find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So for my vertical asymptote, well, remember the vertical asymptote, we set the bottom equal to zero. Now, the vertical asymptote does not cancel, like we said, so we can keep that asymptote. So when I'm going to graph this, I got to realize at zero, I'm going to have an imaginary dotted line. Horizontal asymptotes, look at the degrees of the function. Well, the degree on top is a one, since you don't have an exponent by the x. The degree on bottom is a one since you don't have an exponent by that X. So the top degree equals the bottom degree for this one. So remember, anytime the top and the bottom degree is equal, that's going to be, be the ratio of A over B. Well, for me, A would be five since it's on the top. B, since there's not a number in front of that X, is also a one. So this would be like five over one, which I could reduce to Y equals five. So my vertical was X equals zero. Horizontal is Y equals five. So that takes care of those vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now they said, hey, find the X intercept. So you have to find the x-intercept, we need to set the top of the fraction equal to zero. So set the top equal to zero. So doing that, we would have 5x plus 2 
equals zero. All right, solve that for that X. So we're going to subtract two from both sides. Five X equals negative two, then divide by five. So those cancel and I get X equals a negative two fifths. But remember the X intercept is the point. So we got to write it as an ordered pair. The X value is negative two fifths. And remember the Y value for any X intercept is going to be zero. So now I know where it's crossing the X axis at. Take care of the X intercept. So now all I got left is the Y intercept. To find the Y intercept of a graph, you find F of zero. So that's parentheses, y'all. Let me make that. So we're going to find F of zero. So F of zero for this graph will be five times zero plus two divided by X on the bottom, which is zero. We all look what happens at F of zero. This thing's gonna be undefined because I got a zero on the bottom. So that is undefined. So since my Y intercept is undefined, that means there is no Y intercept. But y'all, that makes sense over here because we got a vertical asymptote at the zero on the X axis. That's right where the Y intercept is. So if you got a vertical asymptote, your graph cannot touch that Y axis on this graph, okay? So what we're gonna do is graph this now. So let me go out about five or so. I guess I'll go up four since I didn't make enough room. Go negative five and then negative five to the left. All righty. So I know I got a vertical asymptote at X equals zero. So that means the Y axis, we would treat it like it's got an imaginary dotted line going down that y-axis. My graph cannot cross over that line, okay? Now my horizontal asymptote was five. So up here at five, as the graph gets bigger and bigger, it's gonna to try to reach this five up here, okay? So as it goes towards infinity, it's gonna to wanna to try to get to that dotted line. So now my X intercept we said was negative two fifths and zero. So wrong, here's negative one. So negative two fifths will be right around in here. Almost in the half of it, but it'll be a little closer to the zero than it is to the negative one, okay? So now I cannot graph cross that Y axis. because we said there's no y-intercept, okay? The graph can only cross it once on the x-axis at that point. So what happens on these? This end is gonna come down towards negative infinity. Up here, it's gonna curve and try to get to that five the best it can. The right side, well, I think I drew it too much down. But the right side, since this end is going down, this side would come in from positive infinity and then try to get to the five on that x-axis. And y'all, that's the trick on these, just uh, so if you notice, they would have four pictures up here and I'd pick B because of the way my graph did, okay? Now, if you need other points to help you, you could put a one in here. Five times one is five plus two is seven. 
on the bottom put a one, seven over one would be seven. So at one, it would be up here at seven, which would be above that. So that's showing you that that end is gonna come down and try to get to that line. Or you could put negative one in there and see what happens at negative one. So if you put a negative one in here, negative five and two is negative three over negative one, which would be a positive three. So right in here at three, you could tell that's the only way this end can go and hit through them points. So if you need an extra point or two, just plug a number in for your X and see what you get. All right, so let me show you. And now 15, I wanted to show you an example of one of these that has a hole in it, okay? So this one, they're giving me F of X equals X plus one over X squared minus one. So first I'll start with my domain. My domain, I set the bottom equal to zero. So now I'm going to factor that to see what I get. So remember, that's an X squared. So you got an X and an X. The last number is negative. So one's positive, one's negative. And then factors of one that will subtract and give a zero because there's not an X in the middle. We treat it like a zero would be one and one. You know, one's the only factors I could have had out of a one, right? It's a prime number. So now take both of these and set equal to zero. So basically, remember, all I'm doing, the factors and the solutions I get are always going to have opposite signs. Because all you're doing at this point is changing the sign to the first one to a negative one, the second one to a positive one. So my domain is going to start at negative infinity. Can I hit that negative one? Union around negative one. Can I hit the positive one? And then union around positive one. Can I get to infinity? So now that I know what numbers made it undefined on the bottom, I'm going to go right into finding my vertical asymptote. So my vertical asymptotes would be x equals negative one and x equals positive one. But y'all look here. When I factored that bottom, I got an X plus one and an X minus one. So this top of X plus one matches one of my factors on the bottom. So basically that X plus one is going to cancel that factor of X plus one on the bottom, which means it's going to cancel out the asymptote of X equals negative one. So that my only vertical asymptote would be X equals positive one. So you always got to check those factors on top because if any of the factors on top cancel when you get the bottom factor, that cancels that vertical asymptote for that factor. All right, so then we would find our horizontal asymptote. So horizontal asymptote on top, the degree would be a one since I didn't have an exponent there. The bottom is a degree two. So for this one, my bottom is bigger than the top. So since the bottom degree is higher than the degree of the top, this automatically had a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. All right, so there's my vertical, there's my horizontal. You know, that's all you're looking at on the horizontal is who has the bigger degree, okay? All right, so we would find our x-intercept next. So the x-intercept, I set the top equal to zero. So that'll be an x plus one, I'm gonna set equal to zero. Now, if you solve that, you would get negative one. But y'all look over here. I'm undefined where X equals negative one. So what happens if that factor matches that factor on top, it's also going to cancel the X intercept. 
because it cannot have a point where it is undefined. So the x-intercept is canceled. Since x cannot equal negative one, right? We kicked that out of our domain right here. So that means we cannot have any points that occur at x value of negative one. So the x-intercept is none, which means it's not crossing that x-axis at all. So then we look at our y-intercept. Y-intercept, I find f of zero. So f of zero for this problem will be zero plus one on top, zero squared minus one on the bottom. So y'all, that's gonna give me a one on top, zero squared is zero minus one, gives me a negative one on the bottom. So I'm gonna reduce that to a negative one. So my, my y-intercept member as a point was zero for the x, negative one for the y. All righty, so it looks like we got enough to graph this one. So we would come down, make a graph, All right, so let's see what we know. We got a vertical asymptote only that happens at x equals one. So over here to one on the x-axis, draw a vertical line. Graph cannot cross that line. Now remember, since I canceled out this horizontal asymptote, over here at negative one, wherever my graph is, there's going to be a hole in the graph. So I'll show you how to draw that hole in a second. All right, so my horizontal asymptote was zero. So that means zero for the y's is the x-axis. So over time, it's gonna to try to get to that x-axis. But remember, it does not cross it because there's no x-intercepts, okay? All right, so no x-intercepts, so I can't draw a point on the x-axis. Y-intercept was zero, negative one. So here is zero, negative one for my Y-intercept. Now, y'all, I got enough to draw this one because remember, this graph has to go down this way. It can't go up because it's not crossing the X-axis. So this one cannot cross the X-axis, so it's going to come down towards negative infinity. It tries to get close to that one, but it cannot cross it. Now this side, remember, it's going to try to reach the x, the horizontal asymptote. So it's going to come up. Right here at negative one would be a hole in the graph. And then it would just keep trying to get close to the x-axis. So we had a hole in the graph instead of a vertical asymptote at that point. Now y'all remember the right side, if this side's coming down, then this side will probably come down from infinity and just curve and try to get close to that x-axis. Um, and I think when they did that, you can actually see which graph has a hole on it when you do it on, on their answers. If you try to graph this one on the calculator, you're not gonna see that hole. So y'all, let me show you how I would graph this so y'all can look. Now remember, I got more than one part on top. I'm gonna put the top in parentheses and the bottom in parentheses when I graph it. So let me share that screen real quick. So y'all gonna go to y equals. So the top, I have my parentheses and then I had an x plus one. All right, close the parentheses and then divide by the bottom, which also has to be in parentheses. That was an X squared.
minus one, close parentheses. So now when I hit graph, I'll get a general idea of what this graph looks like. Oh, let me fix my window. Let me go to zoom six. I think mine was zoomed in. All right, y'all, there you go. So notice on the right side, one side's going up, one side's going down. The calculator don't actually draw the imaginary dotted line for the asymptote, but you can actually tell it's there. And you cannot see the hole in it. The only way you know there's a hole over there at negative one is to go to the table here. And if you, uh, let me get my table set back on one real quick. Instead of going by thirds, I'm just going to set that back on one. Now we'll look at my table. Oh, did it not say it? Oh, I don't want it to start at 0.66. I want it to start at, say, negative five. All right, now we'll be fixed. Won't be no decimal. So notice over here at negative one, you get an error. That means it's undefined there. So that's telling you that the hole there. And then over here at one where your vertical asymptote was, you had an error message. So you're going to get them error messages any time you're at a place where it's going to be undefined. All right, y'all. So let me go back. We're going to go now and knock out 8.6. Eight point six to me is easier than eight point five. Eight point six deals with polynomial inequalities. So there's about four steps we follow when we solve a polynomial inequality. And remember, inequality needs are your less than, less than equals, greater than, greater than equals. So we're going to be solving what we call quadratic polynomial inequalities. So those are those x squared terms. So the first thing solving any equation that has x squared terms, you want to get all terms on one side. equal to zero. So the same thing we had to do when we use a quadratic formula or when we factor, we need everything on one side equal to zero. At that point, I solve the equation. <laughs> so, Quadratic equations, 90% of the time are going to give you two solutions. Sometimes they give you a repeating solution. So I got a problem where one does repeat, and I'll show you what to do when you have that case, okay? All right, once I solve this and got my two solutions, I'm going to set up a number line using the two solutions and then choose a test point. Now I'll tell you, I always choose zero for my test point because it's the easiest number to multiply and add and all that stuff. So personally, I always use zero for my test point. But here's the two possible solutions you'll get on these when you got two answers. So say my answers were A and B. If the middle section is true, then all we're going to shade is the middle section on our number line. The other possibility is 
with these two solutions, A and B. If the middle falls, then we shave the outside edges. So this is the only two patterns we'll have when we got two solutions. They'll either shade in the middle or they'll shade each of the ends. My test point that I choose will determine where I shade. And then y'all, the final thing you do to these, write the answer in interval notation. So if you got A and B is shaded, your interval will start at A and end at B. If your ends are shaded, you'll start at negative infinity till you get to your A, union that with B to positive infinity. Okay, so the interval depend on what we get with our number line. So remember, write in interval notation. So remember, another thing you got to know about interval notation, if it has greater than or equals or less than or equals, interval notation uses the brackets. Anytime it's got equals, it uses brackets, remember. If it's greater than or less than, and it does not have the equals, then our interval notation will have parentheses. Now remember one thing, negative infinity and positive infinity always have curvy parentheses, okay? So we're just talking about those numbers that we get for our solution. And y'all, these steps sound like a lot, but watch. These, these problems are not bad. So number one, we're going to solve the inequality. So these are probably easier for y'all that are good at factoring. If you're not good at factoring, you can solve these using the quadratic formula or the quad program I sent y'all in your email. All right, y'all, here we go. Number one has x minus four times x plus two less than zero. So this one already has a zero like I needed. And they've already factored this one. So since they've already factored this, to get my two solutions, I'm going to set both of these equal to zero. And then we solve it. So the first one, you add four. You get x to the positive four. Second one, I'll subtract two and get x is a negative two. So now, let's set up our number line. We got our two solutions. So let's see, negative two will be on that side and four will be on that side somewhere. So remember, I'm gonna test zero. Zero is gonna be in between that negative two and four. So when I put zero into this equation and test it, if it's true, I'm going to shade that middle. If it's false, I'm going to shade the outer ends, okay? So here we go. Let's test our zero. So to test zero, I will put a zero in for the x's. So I have zero minus four times zero plus two has to be less than zero. So y'all, this will give me a negative four. Zero plus two gives me a two. Well, I guess the question of the day is negative eight less than zero, true or false? And that is definitely true. true. There you go. So since that's true and I use zero as my test point, I shade where zero located. So the only interval where zero was located was in the middle. So we would come in here and shade that middle. Now, this is just to help us. Now, my final answer has to be an interval notation. So the interval is going to be in between negative two and four. So here's the question on that one. Would y'all want me to use the square brackets or the round parentheses? 
rounded parentheses. So rounded parentheses. So we would have parentheses, negative two, go to our four with curvy parentheses. So when you shade the middle, you're only going to have two numbers and then either curvy or square brackets, okay? All right, so the next one, you know, they're probably going to make us factor it. They always give you one where they got it factored, and then they start trying to turn it up on y'all to do the factoring. So here we go. Number two has a x squared minus 13x plus 40 has to be greater than zero. So we're happy on this one. We've already got a zero over here. But y'all, this trinomial is not factored, so we're going to have to factor this and set it equal to zero so that we can solve it. Once we get our two answers, we'll set up our number line. So let's see if y'all remember. I got an X and an X. Can y'all remember what signs I would put into this? Negative on both. Negative on both. Good job. So anytime that last one's positive, they're both like the middle. All right, so the last thing y'all got to do is find me factors of 40 that equal 13. Eight and five. Eight and five. Well, you do like that factor, don't you? <laughs> yep. All right, y'all, all we're doing now is going to change these signs. So add eight to the first one. Add five to the second one. So my two solutions are going to be five and eight. So let's set up our number line. Now, I'm still going to test zero, but y'all guess what? Zero is going to be at this end of it, right? Zero is less than five. So my zero is going to be in this section. So if it's true, I shade the first section and the last section automatically. If it's false, I do not shade that section, and I'll only shade the middle. So here we go. Test zero. I'm going to put a zero back into that equation and see if it's true. So that'll give me zero squared minus 13 times zero plus 40 has to be greater than zero. Now, look, the reason I use zero I ain't got a square zero. Zero squared is zero. It's gone. Any number times zero is zero. It's gone. So all we need to know is, is 40 greater than zero true or false? True. So that is definitely true. So we shade where the zero was located over here. And by default, since you shaded the left end, you automatically shade the right end. So shade where zero located. Okay, so interval notation. This one's gonna have a union because it's got two parts. So this thing's coming in from negative infinity until I hit that five, it's gonna union with the second interval, which starts at eight and heads towards positive infinity. All right, y'all, so the only intervals that'll be present will be that one and that one, okay? All right, y'all got questions on these yet? All righty, so number three is an x squared plus seven x minus 22 has to be greater than or equal to an x minus six. All right, so this time I need a zero on the right side. So remember, I need a zero on the right side. 
So that means I need to subtract six from both sides and add six to both sides to make this side equal to zero. So let me subtract the X here and then add a six right there. So I'm just trying to line up the like terms. So bring down your X squared. Seven X is minus the X, leave you six X. Negative 22 and six give you negative 16. All that's got to be greater than or equal to zero now. All right, y'all. So now let's factor this left side and set this equal to zero. So we got an X and an X. What sign y'all putting in this one? was in a, a negative and a positive because we've got to get that negative 16. There you go. So now finally factors a 16, that'll subtract and give me a six. Eight and two. Eight and two. And remember, since eight's the larger number, it has to have the same sign as the middle number. So there's my eight and my negative two. All right, so now we get these signs changed so we can figure out our number line. So subtract eight on the first one, add two to the second one. So we got a negative eight and two for this one. So y'all check this out. When I test zero this time, it's gonna be in between the negative eight and two. So it's gonna be the center. So here we go, we're gonna test our zero. And I'm gonna use this one we solved right here. So zero squared plus six times zero minus 16 has to be greater than or equal to zero. Well, the zero squared is gone. Six times zero is gone. So the question of the day is negative 16 greater than or equal to zero. True or false? False. So since that's false, don't shade where the zero is located. So zero is located in the middle. I don't shade that, which means by default, I shade both of these ends. All right, so now, since the ends are shaded, we're going to have that negative infinity until we hit that negative eight. What do I use next after that negative eight? Brackets. So that is definitely going to be a bracket. And then union from the second one, which is a two, to our positive infinity. So see, the parts that ain't shaded, they sort of get kicked out of the interval notation because they make it false, okay? So y'all, the trick to these is getting these two numbers and then testing any point. You can test any point. If you tested the point like negative nine and it was true, then that means the right side has to be true also. So any point, I just think zeros are easier to figure out on those. Can uh, you go back for one second, please? Okay, so let me see, right here. Thank you. All righty. All right, number four has an x squared greater than nine. So the easiest way when you got an x squared in a number is to come down here and set the x squared equal to nine. And y'all take square roots of this. Square root of x squared is gonna equal the square root of nine. So that's gonna give me an x equals. Now remember, you gotta get two answers because that x squared so remember now, when we take square roots of numbers, we use the plus or minus three. 
So the timeline will have a negative three and a positive three. I'm still going to test zero, and zero is going to be in between that negative and positive. So let me put a zero in here and see if this is true or false. So zero squared greater than nine. Well, that's just going to give me zero greater than nine. That is definitely false. So since it's definitely false, cannot shade where the zero located. So since zero was in the middle, once again, it's false there. So we got to shade those outer edges. All right, so let's see. Anytime I say the left side, I'm starting at negative infinity till I hit that negative three. And then I'm going to union that from the positive three to the positive infinity. There wasn't an equal bar under here, so I actually used my curvy parentheses. All right, moving on, number five, they got 25 minus X squared is less than or equal to zero. I got an X term and a number, so I'm gonna once again do the square roots. So since my X squared is negative on this side, I'm gonna pull my X squared to the right side. So that that gives me 25 less than or equal to my x squared. So now set it equal to each other and solve it for the x. All I got to do, y'all, is take square roots of both sides. So remember, anytime you don't have that x in the middle, this is probably the easiest to just square root it. Because now square root of 25 will give me a plus or minus five equal to my X. So we can now set up our number line, negative five, positive five. Once again, zero's in the center. So I'm gonna test my zero. Um, you can use any of these equations. You can use the one you started with. You could use the second one. Okay. I'll use that original. So 25 minus zero squared has to be less than or equal to zero. We well, all zero squared is zero. So this gives me 25 less than or equal to zero. That is definitely false again. So remember, since it's false, cannot shade where zero located. So zero was in the middle, cannot shade where it was located. So I shade both of these in. But y'all, this makes sense. Um, like this one up here, x squared greater than nine. In the shaded area, any of them numbers make it true. So four squared is 16, it's greater than nine. Five squared is 25, it's greater than nine. And it does that on the negative side too. Negative four times negative four is 16, it's greater than nine. Negative five times negative five would be 25, it'd be greater than nine. So if you check any of these answers on these sides, it's gonna make that true, okay? All righty, so two intervals. So what y'all think I'm going to put inside these intervals? What's my first interval going to be? Negative infinity. Uh -huh, until you hit? Negative five. And then what are you going to put around that negative five? A bracket. Oh, good job. And then you're going to union that from what to what? Five to positive infinity. There you go, y'all. That's it. Hey, that's the trick on those is uh, get those two answers, test it, 
and then put it in interval notation. And remember, interval notation has cannot include the part you're making false, okay? All right, so let me give you all a second on that one. Now, if you wanted to use quad formula on these, you'd have to get every side, everything on one side equal to zero. And since you don't have an X, your B would be zero when you use the quad formula, okay? All right, y'all, looks like I'm down to two problems. So R number six, we got 10X minus 25 minus X squared is less than zero. To me, this is the trickiest one because it's not in order and the X squared is negative. So first, let's put it in order. So I'm going to put my negative X squared first, my positive 10X, my negative 25, all less than zero. Now, another thing we don't like, we don't like the X squared term being negative. So what I'm going to do I'm going to divide everything by negative one. When you divide everybody by negative one, that's going to change all my signs. Now, remember, I'm dividing an inequality by a negative. So what's that going to do? We got to reverse the little inequality symbol so that it is now greater than. So remember, reverse the inequality. Since dividing by a negative. Okay, anytime you divide an inequality by negative on that x squared to make it positive, you got to reverse that. All right. Okay, so all this negative is doing is changing all these signs. So I now get a positive x squared minus the 10x plus the 25, all greater than zero. So now we're going to factor this. So y'all, what signs would y'all put on this one? Negative. All right. What factors of 25 will equal 10? Five. So look here, this is one of those where I'm going to get a repeating answer. So this was a repeating factor. So what I would do is only take one of those and set it equal to zero. All right, so that we're changing the sign by adding five. So I get X is a positive five. So y'all, my number line is only got one number on it, which is a five. When this happens and you only get one Solution, we only exclude the five from the domain. Or how about from the solution set, we'll call it. We only exclude five from the solution set. So we would start at negative infinity until we hit that five union around that five till we hit positive infinity. Remember the curvy parentheses means five don't count. Because see, five, if you put a five into this, it would make it equal zero, but there's not a bar under that, so we can't count that. So that's why that's the only number we have to exclude. So y'all, no matter what, if you get this repeat, and y'all will for six, you're only going to exclude whatever number you get for that answer. All right, y'all, my last one has X squared plus eight 
is less than 4x. So y'all remember where that 4x is, that needs to be zero. So to make that a zero, we're going to subtract 4x from both sides. So that'll give me my x squared minus 4x plus 8, all of that less than zero. All right, so let's set this equal to zero and factor it. That's going to give me an x and an x. So what signs would y'all put on this one? Minus. All right, so now find me factors of eight that'll add to get me a four. Four. Well, remember eight, there's only two ways to make my eight. I can do one times eight or two times four. But remember, they gotta add, these two factors gotta add to get a four. So one and eight would add to give me one and nine. Two and four would add to give me a six. So guess what? I don't have factors of eight that'll equal four in the middle. So guess what? This one does not factor. Since this does not factor, there is no solution to it. And what we use for no solution, so this will be a no solution. Now, it don't have a choice that says no solution. What you got to put in the answer block, answer box. Have y'all ever seen what we call the empty set? It's a zero with a line through it. Use that for your no solutions in math lab versus having the, they don't give you choice B on these ones for no solution. So check this out. If it does not factor, it is a no solution, okay? All right, y'all, so do y'all have any questions on these? So remember, solve them. Remember, you can use quadratic formulas to solve them or factoring. Once you get these solved, set that number line up and then test you a point on your number line somewhere. True means you shade it. False means you leave it alone and shade to others, okay? All right, y'all, so let me stop that share. Y'all, 8.6 is not as bad, I didn't think, as 8.5 and maybe 8.4 was. Those were two longer sections. 8.6 is not bad. Um, try to catch up to 8.6 Sunday night, because Monday we're going to start reviewing for your third test. Okay? So, since test three, um, it only has 20 questions on the study guide and the test. We'll knock out them 20 questions Monday night for that study guide for test three, okay? So I'm gonna stop our recording because I'm not doing no more writing.